Well, hello, New Story. I'm David. I'm one of the pastors here at New Story, and I have the great joy of sharing God's word with you today. But before I dive in, uh, I wanted to take a moment. We wanted to just pause and take a moment to mourn and pray for the people who lost their lives in Korea the other day. We wanna pray for all of those who've been injured and for all the families of those who've been affected um, by this great tragedy. Over 150 people died and many more injured in a senseless incident in Seoul where there was an apparent stampede at a Halloween festivity. In fact, our sister Kalechi, who's part of our News Story family, she's working in Seoul currently, uh, and she was there at the festivities. But thankfully, she left right before the horrific accident occurred. She was shaken, though, and I know the whole country is shaken as well. Father in heaven, we are saddened and heartbroken by the events that occurred in Korea, where so many people lost their lives. We're reminded again that we truly do live in a broken world. And it's hard to make sense of what happened. And that is why we turn to you. You are the hope of the world. Would you provide comfort and care to those who are mourning the loss of their loved ones? Would you bring complete healing to those who were injured? And somehow out of this tragedy, would you bring good out of it? May people see the fragility of life and be sober-minded and ultimately draw closer to you. And so once again, we lift up the people of Korea up to you at this time. We also wanna pray for Sarah, your beloved daughter. You created her and you know every single cell in her body. Would you strengthen her body to fight off whatever infection she may have? No matter what doctors and nurses might say, you ultimately have the final say. You are the God of impossible. So would you make the impossible possible? And we also pray for David and Sharon, provide them with peace and comfort that comes only from you. Strengthen their faith at this time to know that whatever happens, you work for the good of those who love you. Remind them of your promises and your past faithfulness to help them get through this difficult time. So we humbly and boldly pray in Jesus' name for complete healing. We pray that as a church body, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. You know, there's no great way to pivot, um, but as we pivot, today we are wrapping up our series, Vices and Virtues. Now, I don't know what this series has been like for you, but God has been using it in my life, shaping me and molding me and using it in my life on a personal level. I went into each one thinking, surely not this one. And I walked away seeing God has a lot of growing to do in me. So I just want to make a note that as we go through these, through these vices, these aren't the seven worst sins that you can imagine. But these are called the seven deadly sins because these are the seven cardinal or primary foundation of all other sins. The seven distortions and bends of the human heart that lead to every other sin that breaks the relationship up we have with God and with other people. And today we are going to look at the vice of sloth. I want you to turn to a neighbor and say, sloth. Now, right away, there might be some people in here and those watching online who might think, well, this has nothing to do with me. I'm a busy person. I have a to-do list. I get things done. But before you tune me out, hang on for a moment because I think you'd be surprised that you might have some things to learn today as well. You know, when you think of the word sloth, many people will think of images and of people being lazy, people kind of dragging their feet, being sluggish. My guess is the first image that comes to mind is the animal itself, sloth. Whether it's the two-toed variety or the three-toed variety, take a look at that animal, right? Isn't it so cute? Sloths are never in a hurry. Now, a perfect representation of them is in the movie Zootopia. Anyone seen that movie before? I want you to take a look at this scene real quick. Well, I was hoping you could run a play for us. We are in a really big hurry. Sure. What's the plate? Two nine T number. 
29THD03. Two. Nine. THD03. T. HD03. H. D03. D. Mm -hmm. Zero three. Zero. Three. Hmm. Hey, Flash, want to hear a joke? No! Sure. Mm. Okay. What do you call a three-humped camel? I don't know. What do you call a... Three-humped camel. Three-humped camel. Pregnant. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Uh, 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 <laughs> yes, uh, very funny, very funny. Can we please uh, just focus on this? Hey. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Priscilla. Oh, no. Yes. Flash. What? <gasps> Do. You call a three humped camel uh, pregnant. Okay, great, we got it. Please, humped. I love that scene. It's also hilarious and painful at the same time. And if you work at a DMV, please do not take that to offense, okay? But these images depict passivity, and that may be a part of sloth, but the sin of sloth is not about physical laziness. In fact, if that was the case, if it was just about being physically lazy, some of us can use a little more sloth in our lives. Truth is, I can describe our culture with a number of words, but lazy is not one of them. Now, do we have lazy people in our culture? Yeah. Do you know lazy people in your lives? Of course. But by and large, right, we as a culture are busy people. We overwork ourselves, and in many ways, it's not life-giving, but life-draining. Sometimes we need a little laziness in our lives and we need to recapture the Sabbath. But that's a whole other sermon. See, these days of leisure and rest are not what sloth is addressing. So here's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna find out what sloth actually is. What is the definition of sloth in the spiritual sense? And then we'll look at some forms of sloth and then we'll finish it off with a solution, the remedy for sloth. So the first question is this. What is sloth? If it's not laziness or leisure, what is it that is so problematic that it makes a list of seven deadly sins? What is the sin of sloth? Now to answer that question, we first have to do a little bit of background. So stick with me. The Latin word for sloth is the word asadia. And asadia literally means apathy or another way to put it, I don't care. Anybody ever have the bad cases of I don't cares? Like the less you care about what is going on, it's the power of Asadia to just suck the life out of life. In her book, Asadia and Me, author Kathleen Norris had a few things to say about the I don't cares. Listen to what she writes, quote, when life becomes too challenging and engagement with others too demanding, Asadia offers a kind of spiritual morphine. You know, the pain is there, yet you can't rouse yourself to give a rip, end quote. And she says this with great authority because she lived with a man who was an alcoholic and he was physically and mentally ill. And she knew what it felt like to be at times drawn away from her situation, to try to numb the situation, ignore the situation so she can escape for a while. And there is a real way where we are drawn away from taking responsibility to really just kind of not care. Are you getting a picture of what asadia is? In other words, asadia is taking a step away from responsibility for the things that matter in this life. So if I were to give you the first part of the definition of sloth in the spiritual sense, it would be this. Sloth is choosing not to care about the things that God cares about. Sloth is choosing not to care about the things that God cares about. And right there is where sloth becomes more than just about being physically lazy. 
See, sloth is about the sin of what we don't do. There are sins of commission, right? Things we do that are wrong that we ought not to. But the sin of sloth are sins of omission, things we know we ought to do, but we don't do. Thomas Aquinas says it this way, sloth is the failure to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your substance. Let's take the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 10, verse 27. It says this, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. This is what matters most to God. What matters most to God is your relationship with him and your relationship with other people around you. Now, what's interesting is the opposite of sloth, the virtue of sloth is diligence. And the word diligence in English is based off the Latin root word, deligere, which is translated as to have empathy, esteem, respect, or love for someone else. Now, isn't that weird? So the word diligence is based off the word to love someone else. In other words, if if the opposite of sloth is diligence, then diligence is primarily an expression not of industriousness or, or hard work ethic, but diligence in its purest form is always a function of love and esteem and respect, not just hard work. Diligence is primarily a function of love. So here's the full definition of sloth for us. What is sloth? Here it is. Sloth is choosing not to care about the things that God cares about. A failure to love him and a failure to love other people. It is becoming lazy in our pursuit of God. And it is about becoming lazy in our pursuit of other people. So the first relationship that sloth is relevant to, the first failure of love that erodes the heart is the failure to love God as he calls us to love him. So let me ask you this question. Does this first describe the relationship you have with God? The God who has loved you from the very beginning, he has never stopped loving you. Are you doing day after day after day the most basic things that are required for a human being in our fallen state to have a loving relationship with God even when you don't feel like it? Are you diligent in pursuing God and building this vertical relationship? Or have we gotten lazy in our pursuit of God Because if sloth has taken root in our hearts when it comes to God, it will only be a matter of time before he rose the heart to love others. In other words, if there's a failure to love God, it won't be too long before it affects all our relationships with other people. This is how you can look at a child who's going hungry and say, well, it's not my kid. Or you look at a woman who's been recently widowed and say, oh, that's sad but that's not my mother. Or you look at the needs of a church and say, yeah, I know there's needs, but it's not my problem. We are so hardworking at everything, but when it comes to demands of love and relationships with God and with other people, so many of us are just so ready to lay down, give up, and not care. See, sloth is the sin of not caring about the things that God cares about, loving him and loving other people. Let me read you a story from Scripture. It comes from Matthew chapter 25. If you have your Bibles, Matthew chapter 25, we're going to be reading from verses 14 through 30, and then I'm going to jump down to verses 34 and 36. And beginning in verse 14, again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one, he gave five bags of gold, to another, two bags, and to another, one back, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. Verse 19. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, 
good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Verse 24, then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. And his master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. All right, Jesus, that's kind of harsh, right? You knew that I would harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then, you should have put money on deposit with the banker so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Kind of, all right, Jesus, it's kind of extreme, right? Now jump down to verse 34 because you got to understand, what is he talking about? Yeah, he's talking about these talents and these, this money that has been entrusted to him. But what is Jesus ultimately talking about? Go down to verse 34. That the king will say to those on his right, come you, are who are, come you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Listen, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. See, this parable of the talents in many ways speaks about what we're talking about today. The two of the landowners take the money given to them and they nurtured it. They invested it. They made it grow. They did something with it. But the third one was given an amount of money and he went and buried it in the ground and walked away from it and left it alone. Sloth is when we take the things of God, when we take the things we know that God values and we bury it and we walk away. Look, you don't have to do anything wrong to commit the sin of sloth. You just have to not do some things. And when you don't do the things that matter to God, life begins to fade. That's what the end of this chapter talks about. That's what Jesus is talking about. You know the things that matter to me, so go do it, God says. Because there is coming a day where we will make reconciliation with the life that we live. And we will stand before the one who will say, did you care about anything that I cared about? Like, did you care about anything that mattered to me? Like, did you pursue me even when it, you didn't feel like it? Did you persevere through that difficult relationship? Were you diligent in loving the unlovable? Did you go out of your way to make things right what was wrong? Were you able to forgive your parents for the stress, hardships they put you through? Did you fight for your marriage? The slothful one resists the demands of love when it gets hard. So if that's what sloth is, then what are some forms of sloth? What are the forms of sloth? How do we know that we struggle with sloth in our lives? How does it manifest itself? Well, if sloth is not just laziness or leisure, but it is choosing not to care about the things that God cares about, a failure to love him and a failure to love other people, there are two main expressions and forms of sloth, and they can range from mild to extreme. So here's the first form of sloth. Let's see. It's apathy. Apathy. Sheer apathy. This is a shutdown. Like, I don't care. 
Like, don't even finish your sentence. Stop talking. I'm not listening anymore. Nothing matters, and I'm dead inside. I give up. What's the point? Like, I tried with God. I tried with my loved ones, and there was no change. So you know what? I give up. I'm done. Apathy. Now, every single one of us, we have been there at one point, haven't we? Right? I know I'm not the only one. I hope I'm not the only one. But I know we all have gone through that at different points in our life. Now, I'll grant you that most of us, we get to that place because we've been disappointed or hurt. Like, what do you want me to do, God? Like, I tried. I really did. And you didn't show up. You were silent and absent in my prayer. So we shut God out. Or maybe it's not God we shut out, but other people in our lives that we shut out. Maybe it's your father or mother or your coworker or your friend that hurts you. And maybe you really, really did try to make it work, but nothing's changing and you've had enough. You're frustrated and you're angry, so you just shut people out. It's passivity taken to an extreme. It's the numbing of the heart. It's shutting down of the heart so I don't have to feel anymore. You know, it's a thousand mile stare. You know how you walk into where you live and your family's there, but you know, you hate your family. And so you walk in and you just, how's your day? Whatever. And you just ignore, you just kind of walk. And you know exactly what you're doing. You're hurting them more by your cold deadness than by your aggression. And it's easy to fall into that because it's a way of empowering ourselves. Okay, if you're not going to love me right, then you just won't have me. I will disappear from your world. It's giving up on the possibility of love. It's quitting, and I know why we get there. I know. But I urge you, don't get there, not with God and not with other people. There are some of us in here who are slothful in this manner. The second form of sloth is avoidance. Avoidance. Now, avoidance in relation to sloth is running away from God or other people by occupying ourselves with busyness. This is running around like a chicken with his head cut off, right? Doing everything and anything. And how can it be that frenetic busyness can show up in a definition of sloth? Because in reality, the busy person occupies themselves to avoid the issue at hand. You get that? It's avoidance whether with God or other people, if you're not going to love me right, then I'm going to find it elsewhere. I will do whatever it takes to feel alive outside of this relationship. Therefore, I won't give you the time or the day. I won't acknowledge you, and you escape. Some of you, you work harder, right? You work and work and work, workaholism. I have to stay at work. Oh, I can't come in today. I have so much to do. No, you chose to be at work because you don't want to be at home. You can work from home. Some of us, you play harder. You fill your life with constant activity to get your mind off of the real issues and problems with others. It could be sports. It could be video games, shopping, travel. Maybe you binge watch shows hour after hour after hour. Think about how much diligence is needed to binge watch a whole drama in two days. I've been there, and I watched an entire season of a show in two days. I can't say I'm proud of it, but it was hard work. (laughs) And I would justify it. This is not addiction. I'm just caught up in the story. But you know what's really going on. There's a story in my real life, and I couldn't face my actual story. So I choose instead to root for these fictional characters. Because I didn't want to face God because I was ashamed of my sins. I didn't want to face my wife because she hurt me. I don't want to reconcile with my friend because they wronged me. So I just look busy and avoid at all costs. Maybe it's activism for a good cause. Whatever it is, some of the most slothful people are the busiest people. Because the busyness helps you avoid the issues. Now, all the lists that I went through, these are good at face value. They are not inherently bad. We just have to be honest with ourselves about the motivation behind it. But some of us are so busy doing so we don't have to love God as God calls us to love. It's easier that way. We don't have to love other people the way God calls us. It's easier that way. Apathy, 
and avoidance. Do you see these symptoms in your life? Then you and I might have an issue with the sin of sloth. So the real question then is, what do we do now? What is the solution for sloth then? If we recognize our apathy or avoidance or busyness, what do we do to overcome the sin of sloth in our lives? And at first glance, the solution for sloth might seem counterintuitive. Because if sloth's greatest urge is to give up or get out, then the greatest remedy is diligence to stay put and bear down. Are you with me? Let me give you two practical solutions that helps me when I am slothful. Here's the first one. And you know, the answer is always Jesus, but I'll give you two practical reasons. Number one, it's rest with Jesus. Isn't it interesting? Rest with Jesus. Be diligent in resting with Jesus. Look, if the greatest temptation of sloth is to give up or get out, then the greatest remedy is to work at staying right where you're at. Rather than running away from Jesus, having the diligence to actually sit in Jesus' presence and letting him speak truth and encouragement into your life. Novelist Flannery O'Connor was asked about the demise of the modern novel. And she said something that was profound. And I want to kind of relate it to what we're talking about. This is what she writes, quote, People without hope not only don't write novels, but what is more to the point they don't read them. She's saying the reason novels are dying is because nobody reads long stuff anymore. And listen to what she wrote as she continues. They don't take long looks at anything because they lack the courage. Some of the reasons we give up or we get out is because otherwise we would actually have to sit there and take long looks at this which is my so-called life. My relationship with God, my relationship with my loved ones, my life, and I would actually have to take a long look at my life and make some meaning out of it, find some peace in it. And what she's suggesting is that more and more people are taking the easy way out and we lack the courage to take the long looks. The only way out of sloth is to have the courage to stay put, rest with Jesus, and have that long look at our own real life and make sense of what's really going on and what the enemy is trying to do in our lives. You know, there is a lot that I dislike about the pandemic and being in isolation and what that did. I hated it. But one thing I'm so thankful for was that it created a new rhythm for me. And as funny as it sounds, it gave me time to get away and be with God, being diligent in spending time with God. Now, isn't it ironic that the cure for sloth is rest with God? So weird, but it works. It's peace with God, and then I spend time with God, and then I roll up my sleeves and do the hard work of looking at my life and my relationships. It helps me fight the urge to get up or get out in my sudden impulse. And suddenly I hear the voice of God and I come back ready to love everyone else better. And there's a second practical solution and it's this, re-engage, re-engage with people. You see, after having spent time and rest with God, he will often lead you to a place of re-engagement with others, particularly with those you're having issues with. Who is that difficult person God wants you to re-engage with? Or maybe it's about getting involved and serving God in some capacity. Look, I know it's easier not to get involved because it's easier that way. You don't have to have the responsibilities. You don't have to deal with people. And yet the answer for sloth is to engage in ministry for God and with other people. And just FYI, just a little throwing it in there. We have so many opportunities for you to engage here and new story. There are service and volunteer opportunities everywhere. If you want to overcome sloth, you need to re-engage. Don't just stand on the sidelines. It is so important that we do this on a regular basis. Look, I get it. I know it's so much easier to give up on God or quit on people when things get hard. 
But church, let us not become slothful in the things that matter to God. Let's not become spiritually or relationally lazy. Amen? Let me close with one final illustration that, that I hope captures the heart and the attitude that I want you guys to have as we think about this idea of sloth and fighting it. You know, when I was in high school, one summer, my basketball coach pitted our team against his friend's team who was a coach at another school. And this was just gonna be a practice run, a scrimmage during the summer. And our coach was just gonna observe without saying anything. He wanted us to just kind of run, play the game, figure things out by ourselves. The thing was, this other team we were playing against, they were really, really good. They were much older than us. They were faster than us. They were stronger than us. By the time we were in the second half, we were gassed. We were tired. We're huffing and puffing. <sighs> I saw it in everybody's face on my team. They did not want to be there. Okay? We knew by our body language, facial expression, that this was over. Let's go home. Let's just uh, throw in the towel. Let's call it a day. It's too hard. But something happened within the next minute or so. Our point guard hit multiple three-pointers in a row. Uh, he was really good. He hit multiple three-pointers in a row. And after hitting that last three, you know what he said? He said something that you'd say today, but it was revolutionary at the time. You know what he said? He looked at all of us and said, let's go! Let's go! It was like such a raw intent of emotion, right? It was like, whoa! And here's what he was saying. You need to stop laying down and stop pouting. We're still in the game. Don't lay down. Be here now. Be present. There's still time. Let's go. Let's fight. It's still worth it. That heart captures this decision not to run, not to quit, not to give up or to get out, but to stay right here and to finish it well. Do you get that? That is what God is calling us to. Let's go. Don't quit. Don't run. And the value of that is that it allows you and I to re-engage with our actual life. Not the life you wish you had, but the life you're actually living right now. The stuff that you want to run from. Are you finding that love is falling apart in your life, in your relationship with God, and as a result, every other relationship in your life? And you're tempted to give up and get out. Have you started to believe lies like God hasn't given me what I need? He doesn't have my back. He's not fair. He's not with me. He won't help. He will. He has never given up on you. He still sees you in the valley you're walking through right now. He knows the difficult relationship you have with others. You're not invisible to him, and you still matter to him. So don't give up on him, and don't give up in your other relationships, even though it's easier to do so. I want to give you a moment to just kind of sit with the spirit who knows you best and loves you most. And ask the question of yourself. First, are you failing to love God? Are you giving up on loving God because of disappointments or hurts? Are you becoming lazy in pursuing your relationship with God? And then secondly, are you failing to love others in return? Are you giving up on other people because of disappointments or hurts? Are you becoming lazy in reconciling and living with others who might see things differently, behave differently. Where have we neglected to do the things that matter most to God? Let's go before the Lord, and I wanna give you a minute just for the spirit to move and work in your hearts. And then I'll close this in prayer. Bow with me.
Lord, we admit that we can oftentimes become slothful in our relationship with you and with other people. You know our tendencies to run away from you and from others when things become difficult or when things don't pan out the way we want it to or when others hurt or disappoint us. It's easier just to not care or keep ourselves busy but help us through the power of the Holy Spirit to stay put and not give up on what's important to you. Let us be diligent in pursuing you and pursuing others even when we don't feel like it. So would you help us now and let your word take its root in our hearts. Help us all. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen.